30 years in law enforcement and just 29 at Nicollet County. Can you just take me through your timeline? How did you get there? Why did you start becoming a police officer and all that good stuff? Sure. Well, at a very young age, I wanted to be in law enforcement. I joined the military and went to basic training at 17 years old. And I went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and then Fort Dix, New Jersey for my military training and then came back and uh, graduated high school and went on to Mankato State University where I got my four-year degree and uh, and back then was a much different time you know for law enforcement my first job I applied at was in New Prague Minnesota and uh, there were 400 applicants for one job and now we're lucky to get double digits for you know there's hundreds of law enforcement jobs all over the state and so yeah a lot of things have changed but I always wanted to be in law enforcement um, I'm from a farming community and my family farmed and at that time, I didn't want to do that. So I, I wanted to get in law enforcement, and I've been here um, in this area uh, my entire career. I'm from Lee Center, but just worked across, or just came across the river and worked here at Nicola County for, for since 95. Crazy. Is there any reason mm -hmm. why you wanted to stay, like in the Midwest, in Minnesota? Um, yeah, mainly because of, of family, and I wanted my kids to go to a smaller school. Um, and being part of a smaller community, you know everybody. And in my job, um, to be, to be uh, good in law enforcement or to be a good police officer, you just need to know the people in your community and you need to know what they do and when they do it. And if you know the answers to those three questions, you'll, be, uh, 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 you'll, you'll have a good head up on, on what's going on in your county. And developing relations with business owners and the residents where they trust you to share information so many of these violent crimes we see where people don't want to come forward or have their name involved, you need, law enforcement needs to build those relationships with their community members. And fortunately, over the years, I've had that opportunity to do that, um, you know, over three decades. Thank you for that. And you're kind of answering another question. I wanted to ask, you know, being an investigator is really hard work. My mom was a paralegal for the public defender's office back in South Dakota. and. Mm -hmm. I, growing up, I saw like a glimpse of that world and how difficult it is. So it's very interesting to hear about how you look at community and how that works with that too, with that investigative piece. Why did you go into investigative work? Um, I want to I've always been a very strong advocate for victims of crime. Uh, first part of this is finding out who committed the crime and getting them arrested. Um, sometimes that's the easy part, um, but advocating for victims and seeing Things make it through, your cases make it through the court process, and empowering victims of crime, whether it's a, a grandmother whose home was broken into and is scared to stay in their house anymore. Uh, so burglary victims, victims of assault, sexual assault. Um, I'm on the child advocacy team, and uh, standing up for those uh, who are the most vulnerable in our county is a rewarding uh, piece or aspect to being an investigator. I'm glad you brought up this how you are an advocate for victims of a crime, because I did want to talk about that too. Throughout your entire career, um, have you seen more justice served because of that advocacy that you brought and bring, or have you seen other officers <coughs> kind of feel that compassion too? I do. I think we have a, a very strong law enforcement presence here in Southern Minnesota. I'm very proud to have served with the officers that are here. And I do think more now than ever do we have more uh, advocacy programs for victims of crime. Um, on the other hand, I also see that we've been somewhat soft on people who um, commit crime. I'm all for giving help and resources to those that are mentally ill, for those that are addicted uh, to different chemicals. However, I do believe people still need to be held accountable for their actions. Uh, and, and I think for the justice system to work, that has to happen swiftly. Sadly, a lot of these cases now are taking years to make it through the court system. And if you're the victim of crime, I don't think that feels like justice. And I don't think that really even does its job for the perpetrators if it takes years for you to have consequences for something you did. You couldn't go after your kids and, and punish them for something they did last week and have it be impactful. So um, hopefully that can be something that is, um, is improved upon because I think we have room for that there. Thank you for that. And I know we haven't talked about what you're doing next and we don't necessarily need to get to that right now, but a part of that I do want to talk about is um, 
are you still going to advocate for victims of a crime when you leave your position or what will that look like or how will um, that look like to you? I don't know what my capacity will be. I do speak. Um, I do go around to speaking engagements. I've done a lot of them on sex trafficking and um, uh, I've been all over the state. I've probably done 75 or 80 presentations to all different types of conferences and civic organizations in and around Nicola County. Um, and that was free of charge and I've done that, that forever. So I don't know in what capacity I'd be asked to. And yeah, I, am, I have never been retired. Um, so I, that's a very weird deal. Uh, I've never quit a job until I've had another one. And everybody that I've spoken with who have retired said, don't do that. Wait and see what's out there. Because once you're retired, you don't know what options you'll get. So um, I, don't know what I'll, I don't know what I'll end up doing. But I, I, I do like uh, and have a passion uh, for advocating for victims of crime. Thank you. And I want to go back to your work that you have done. And you mentioned sex trafficking. And that's been one of, I think, the biggest highlights in your career. Something that everyone in the newsroom kind of recognizes and acknowledges, as I'm sure our viewers will too. So could you talk to me a little bit about what exactly that looked like for you? I knew there were stings. And I know that there was a coalition group that came out of it. Can you just clarify? Well, we have, we have uh, um, in 2008, I started a group that's MSCIC. That's the Minnesota Self Central Investigator Coalition, along with several other investigators. And so after 13 years or whatever it's been, we, we have training and we have two objectives with that group. One is to train police officers. So we have money that we uh, bring in the best presenters we can and have uh, area law enforcement attend at very low cost or free uh, local trainings. And the other mission, uh, part of that mission statement of that group is to advocate better relations with the community. So we fund like fishing with a cop, cops and bobbers they call it, shop with a hero, toys for tots. We want people in crisis to know that cops care about them. And we put money and, and, uh, and, and take those kids out to do those types of programs. We think that's important. Um, the sex trafficking portion was something that uh, we were challenged at at a school many years ago and, and said, if you don't think you have a problem in your community, just simply go online and put an ad up. And if nobody calls, then you don't have a problem. Well, we came home and took that challenge and put an ad up and the phone rang off the hook. And so now if we were going to do those investigations, we had to have individuals that were trained in, in uh, conducting them. So several of us went uh, to school up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, received that training and then started doing um, those things here. And which, yeah, we arrested 130, 140 individuals that wanted to buy sex. And that at the time was through the Women's Foundation. We received a grant called uh, uh, Minnesota Girls Aren't For Sale. And uh, we, were, uh, we were arresting more people down here than what were being arrested in the cities. So much so that when the Super Bowl came to Minnesota, they called me to come up and be interviewed on NPR News. And I said, I work in Nicollet County. We're the land of corn and soybeans. But they've seen the impact that we had. And then COVID came. And when COVID came, we had to wear masks. Well, we can't do an undercover sting with COVID and wearing masks because people in the real world and that are in the life wouldn't be wearing masks in that type of setting. So, but we couldn't expose people to possible COVID. And so that, that really put the, the brakes on, on doing those uh, types of investigations. And the ones, uh, there was a Mankato officer, a New Alma officer and myself that were the three that are trained. And uh, the New Alma officer is now retired. Uh, the Mankato officer went to work at Blue Earth County as a deputy and now I'm retiring. So for those to continue, there's going to have to be some more training. And, and uh, you know, I know residents uh, approved of it a lot. Women were super supportive of doing those type of investigations. And I do think they should continue. Thank you for doing or talking mm -hmm. about that, because I think we forget like how much the pandemic has affected police work like that, especially sting operations. I didn't know that those were necessarily gone now. Are they gone mm -hmm. or they're just left? They have not. There hasn't been any since the since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, you know, the training. There's still some funds available, but having trained people that are trained in doing them, they're highly volatile. The BCA did one in, I think, Alexandria and ended up it was involved in a police shooting as a result. It's a very volatile situation when they show up and realize they're going to jail. 
and they understand the impact of that, that they're probably, their wife isn't going to be happy, maybe get divorced. Depending on their job, they may be fired. And so all those things in an instant goes through their mind that this is, gonna, this is a big deal. Yeah. And that makes a very volatile situation um, in, in taking them individuals into custody. Yeah. Thank you for explaining all of that. And you know, you were talking how you hope that there is more training going forward. Is there anything else that you're hoping that goes forward either with the Nicollet County Sheriff's Office or a MSCIC that you hope will continue or well, just go forward? MSCIC is one thing I'm very proud of that, you know, I've heard, I've heard some cops say, I worked my entire career, whether they work patrol or a state trooper once told me, I went out and I wrote tickets for 30 years and I can go out on that same highway today and people are speeding and they just don't feel like they, they had a, a long legacy, which they did. It was important what they were doing. Um, this group, this organization, I think is very important to me that it, it'll, it will be here long beyond and doing uh, wonderful things in the community after I'm, after I'm gone. So I'm proud of that aspect. And um, the individuals that I've had the opportunity to serve with here they're young, they're very smart cops. They're one of the biggest changes in my 30 years is technology. I mean, if I gave you a speeding ticket 30 years ago and we went to court, we tried to hire people with integrity. And the judge, you'd say, I wasn't speeding, and I would say, yes, you were. And the judge would ask you, uh, you know, do you have any reason to believe that his equipment or whatever he used to, to justify stopping you was inaccurate? And, and you were found guilty for the most part. And now everything has to be videoed and audioed and redacted and the amount of media that has to be collected for a very simple thing such as a traffic stop, uh, it costs a lot of money, employees, you know, storage on all of the interactions. But people have to remember there are millions and millions of traffic stops done by law enforcement every day and they go on just fine. There is no issue. And, the, and with all of the things that are taking place in the news uh, right now and in, in Minnesota, the simplest thing, if people comply on the side of the road, nobody would get shot. Nobody would be injured. Comply, at, uh, if you wanna fight a ticket, you have every right to do so, but you have to do that in court. Follow the instructions, but you know, people always say, well, law enforcement shouldn't stop this person there. We don't get to say where that traffic stops. I've turned my lights on behind you. You are dictating where we stop. I don't get to dictate that. And, you know, I don't know why you're running. I don't know if you have weapons in the car and what your motive is for leaving or why, why this is a, a, you know, it could be a very simple speeding ticket turns into something tragic and violent. But if, if people would comply and argue your case, if you think you want to file a complaint against an officer or argue a traffic ticket, do it in court. It's very safe to do it in court, but not on the side of the road. Thank you for all those messages because you're right, technology has been changing so much throughout obviously your entire career. And then write that message of going to court, just following the basic law, it's very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Another thing I kind of wanted to touch on since you've mentioned it um, is like th the numbers now that we're seeing of recruits coming in. And I guess from your perspective, is there a reason why numbers are so low? Maybe just in our area, for example. And then what are you seeing like in universities like MSU right now where we have like our programs there? And what do you look forward to with these recruits that do come in? What are you hoping for there? I think the new recruits that we have, I, I give all of them credit because in the times we're in, for, for kids still to want to go into law enforcement or want to be a cop, I give them credit, a lot of credit. Um, I, I, the trends we see are low, they're, they're not good. There isn't a lot of kids that, nothing in the numbers that we used to have. And it's, it's a good retirement. I mean, I'm pretty young and get to retire at a pretty young age, but kids aren't thinking of that. You know, you don't think about that when you're 18, 19 years old. Uh, I think that um, the, the, the numbers aren't going to improve. The community overwhelmingly supports law enforcement in Southern Minnesota. People in Mankato, Nicollet County support law enforcement. We feel that. When the bad things happen, people are dropping cookies off at the office or doing things that are to show their support. Uh, the, the, but our elected leaders, our elected leaders we have a little more of an issue with, especially in the state. Uh, you know, people, if you're a law enforcement officer, you are still uh, eligible for due process. You don't lose your rights. So if I am involved in a deadly uh, incident, 
I have the right to uh, go to court. We can't have our leaders out claiming this happened or that happened without the evidence. And we have to follow a process. Everything has to be instant now. Everybody wants instant gratification. They want all the tapes to be public. Everything needs to be done. Well, as an investigator, I know that isn't how investigations take place. To do a complete and thorough investigation and all law enforcement officers are citizens and they have the right to due process just like everyone else. Uh, and and, unt and I, until our community um, and our elected officials come forward and support law enforcement, because like I just said, for me to solve crimes in the county, people need to trust me and they need to build those relationships. And that takes time. And right now we see officers bouncing agency to agency, maybe for a better schedule, maybe for a little more pay, but that breaks those relationships and now they gotta start over and meet the people they serve. One thing that comes to mind when I think of a relationship we can have with our elected officials and our law enforcement is we have that BCA lab coming to Mankato mm -hmm. and we're just talking about the time frame of what it takes for investigative work and obviously you're in a criminal work and so with that money and that facility coming to Mankato does that give you a little bit hope? It's awesome that is absolutely going to be an awesome resource because uh, people believe what they see on TV that in a half hour they can solve a homicide case when in fact uh, when we have we have found remains and want DNA done uh, many times we wait months and months for DNA results and, and people don't get that but that's what real life is you know, they have to be submitted, uh, collected and submitted properly, and they have to be uh, prioritized at the lab. And so having a lab here in Mankato will be huge, will greatly benefit uh, us. So, um, yeah, again, more technology changes. You know, our cars have cameras. The officers, the cameras are now being in implemented at the agencies all throughout southern Minnesota. Um, and you can argue, if, is that good or bad? I think for the most part, people are happy about that. Um, but I also say with that, there needs to be uh, a little bit of understanding that, you know what, at some point and some day an officer may say something. If each person, a teacher or any other elected official had to wear a camera every day, all day, and anything you said is scrutinized, people are human. And uh, that just has to be kept in context. Thank you for saying all of that. Um, I kind of want to go back to your career before we wrap things up here. Is there any other accomplishments that you can think of going back that you want to highlight or just remind viewers about? Um, or that you just feel like you know you will take that home and remember it? Well, there, there's been a lot of cases throughout the year. We had a, a big prolific bank robber that we caught in, in St. Peter and the St. Peter officers were, were uh, a, a big part of that, but had done dozens and dozens of bank robberies and we caught him in, in, um, in St. Peter. What year um, was that? Oh, I'd have to look. It's been a quite a, it was called, he was a, the, he wore a black neoprene mask uh, all the time when he did these bank robberies. And, uh, and a St. Peter cop actually went out and sat on the side of the road. They had one that happened down in Brewster, Minnesota and said, huh, if he left down there, it takes about an hour to get back up here. And a vehicle matching that description came through and he had the gun and the money and, and uh, you know, that, that was a, uh, that was a huge deal. We've seen, um, uh, as far as, you know, we've, we don't have near the amount of homicides that we have in the cities, but we're seeing it more and more in rural Minnesota where, um, where homicides are happening. And um, whether it's that's the stress that people are under, there's a lot of people with mental health issues that uh, are, are um, out in the public and um, whether or not they're receiving services or not, there's a lot of people under a lot of stress. Uh, but we never, when I started, a homicide was something that, that was a rare, very, very rare event that took place. And, and now, sadly, there's been a lot of them in, in greater Minnesota. Um, but as far as any particular cases, I was fortunate to receive many awards through the FBI and the Sheriff's Association, through MSCIC and my colleagues um, that have given me awards. And uh, I'm proud of all of those accomplishments. And uh, uh, what I'll take when I retire is probably the relationships and friendships that I've built uh, from state troopers to DNR to all the officers in and around the area. And over the past two years, individuals that I went to college with have been retiring and new people have been coming up. And uh, that's when you kind of, they, they always told me when it's, when it's time, you'll know when it's time to retire. And I know it's time to retire. 
Well, congratulations. Thank you. It's really great. You have a great legacy here. Is there anything else that you'd like to say that you think I'm missing or you think you just want no. our viewers? To I, think, I, I think one of the things that I also appreciate is uh, the um, relationship that, that I've had with the media over my career. Um, they've always, I thought, treated me fair, and we tried to keep you up to date on what we're doing, whether it was sex trafficking or big cases, to let the public know what we're doing, and I've always tried to, uh, to do my best to keep the public informed of, of what's going on in their community. Thank you for joining us today, Mark. Thank really you. appreciate Thank it. You.